Okay, we're going to continue with uh, contemporary art worldwide. Um, we're going to look at abstract painting and sculpture by two Japanese artists, and then we're going to look at installation and site specific, um, and we're going to look at architecture, and specifically we're going to look at deconstructivism whenever it comes to architecture. Okay, so we're going to begin uh, the PowerPoint for abstract painting and sculpture. It's going to be figure 32, 33, and it's a uh, Kusama, and it's a picture picture of she seated in uh, the environment where a whole bunch of her paintings are, and um, she's a Japanese painter, and her work is all, all often described as psychedelic. Now, what that really means in regards to the art field is where <clears throat> the artist often or the individual often blends into the environment around them and in this case it's based off of her dress what she's wearing and then also her accessories and her choice of hair color that fits with this very abstracted uh, design in each painting that she has presented so that's often why it's called um, a psychedelic it's kind of this wavy kind of undulating in and out of where you are and where the painting begins where the painting ends and then where you begin and she uses certain uh, attire and accessories that she wears to kind of fit into this psychedelic uh, type of imagery um, she does draw upon the biomorphic surrealism so again if you remember Juan Miro uh, was one of the first that we talked about with biomorphic surrealism and a couple others have uh, built off of that. Uh, Alexander Calder uh, with some of his uh, kinetic uh, mobiles that Duchamp labeled. Um, those were uh, pulled from some of the shapes that Moreau would doodle um, in his biomorphic uh, surrealistic um, paintings. And if you recall, biomorphic surrealism is the just not unconscious but very unattentive approach to making an object. Um, there's not uh, a forced attention to the direction in which the shape and uh, form needs to take. And then after that, it's a conscious effort to repeat that, un not unconscious, that unattentive drawing and then attentively use it in some kind of composition throughout the canvas. So that was the biomorphic surrealism. And um, Kusama is uh, taking some of those ideas and those trained uh, Western um, and uh, European um, painting styles and using them in her in her psychedelic paintings. She also uses a motif and if you remember what motif is from Cezanne it's studying a moment and she will take a motif of the polka dot. Uh, so looking at the polka dot as you can see in figure 32-33 she's wearing it. Some of her paintings around her also have a similarity in the polka dot in that single that single pointed object known as the polka dot and it's being patternized throughout the composition and then she'll study that as a moment and create a motif of that polka dot throughout uh, her compositions and like I said before she wears her dress um, that is based off of her own designs and she incorporates it into uh, the environment during the openings and in her placement and such and and you also have an opportunity to become part of this kind of psychedelic engagement between the paintings and yourself because Louis Vuitton actually picked up her work um, picked up her um, her dress and attire and accessories and sells them globally um, so there is an option to actually buy a Kusama dress or accessory be able to wear it and then you go into one of her openings and then you have that direct in, in uh, interface with the paintings at that psychedelic level so she's very um, um, very well known around the world um, in, in, in help, helped by the fact that Louis Vuitton and a few other uh, clothing um, um, uh, powerhouses also have uh, engaged in wanting to produce her clothing based off of her paintings. So uh, really smart, really, really great. 
So that's a, an element abstract painting. Let's look at an abstract sculpture, which is a little different. Uh, still a Japanese Tisuchinya. Uh, and this is called Symptom from 1987, and it's figure 3234. And here, it's not about the studying of Western uh, European painting like uh, Kusama was part of but more deeply rooted in Japanese, Japanese religious culture, in particular the Shinto, um, the belief in Shinto. And the, the belief of Shinto is that humans are part of the placement in the totality of nature. And so Tetsuchimiya is actually um, wanting to imbibe that spirit of Shinto, Japanese Shinto belief, into his abstract uh, sculptures. He often will use uh, branches and driftwood like we see here uh, with symptom it's a combination of uh, corded uh, branches put together um, those are often the materials that he's using and it's it's nature right so by having the use of branches or driftwood it, 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 it it's a resounding voice coming from nature uh, which kind of goes back to that idea of totality of nature not just humans are separate from nature but humans are actually incorporated in the activities of nature and vice versa um, yeah so he wants to uh, bring out and present the life of nature uh, from the trees so that's why he chooses the trees and what's really interesting is if we look back in the Jomon period of Japan which is one of the first documented um, they uh, Jomon J-O-M O N actually means corded and it's the idea of like corded wood together or knotted uh, fibers that are corded like rope rope would be a cord um, and it comes from that time period where uh, they're coming out of an ice age and starting to develop a form of civilization from a hunting and gathering type of lifestyle and this symptom actually looks like it's corded with all these branches so you can see that this technique and this design dates all the way back to this connection with nature which is really much what Shinto is about and most folks in Japan incorporate the idea of Shinto it's not necessarily a religion it's a it's more of a an, a, an everyday lifestyle of keeping yourself in contact with everybody as well as nature and it's holistic and it's collective so the work is reflecting that element of totality and collectiveness right um, and he wanted to see as if the wood has the same life force as he himself so there's no difference between the maker and that of the branches that are used to give this spiral like composition that you see in figure 32 34 right and now we're going to talk about installation and site specific and we're going to move to figure 3238 <clears throat> and uh, installation in particular is a new media um, and uh, often a lot of the new medias that are coming out at this time in the 1980 uh, late late 1980s 1990s 2000s and such are called new medias and in particular these new medias are used and they're categorized as installations now what an installation is like here with holes are untitled it's a, a, an assemblage that is created um, that creates an artistic environment in a room right like we see here this is inside of the uh, Guggenheim in New York City and this is the ramp that uh, slowly goes down from the top to the bottom and the bottom to the top and then there's a series of uh, sayings in in LED lights that spiral through that through that uh, that ramp that goes up and down and so that's why we call it an installation we call it because it's an assemblage um, that is created in, that creates an artistic environment in a specific room um, and then the opposite of that is site specific which we'll talk about here in just a minute which is meant for one particular place that has a certain meaning and if you build that same concept in a totally different place um, it won't have the same meaning or purpose so that's what site specific is s-i-t-e 
S-P-E-C-I-F-I-C. -I -I -C. It's specifically meant to be for that area, that region, that room, that place, whatever it might be. That's what makes it site specific. So with um, Holzer's Untitled, um, she uses LEDs, which is light emanating diodes. Um, I think most of us know what LEDs are at this point, and also a series of light projection shows throughout um, this space. And um, she's spiraling the LED display around the inner ramp of the Guggenheim Museum. Um, and she's also using, for the first time, these authoritative tones, so different statements throughout, um, and these different statements like men are not uh, uh, monogamous, by na monogamous by nature. It's these very authoritative tones and um, almost contradictory in some case. And it, it's, it may seem odd at first, but she's learning from, um, if you remember, Nomen's, uh, the use of the neon lights to create that spiral with a very kind of contradictory tone, an authoritative tone as well. So she's, she's, she is a, a, a progressed or an evolved element of what Nomen was, um, was developing with the neon lights and the neon tubes. And here she's using it with new material that's newer than neon lights and that's the LED lights. So she's taking these concepts and then she's making it more expansive and more elaborate using the LED lights and the light projection. So if you think about it with Nomen's the spiral, it's those neon tubes to be able to compare how that is kind of flat and up on a wall versus this is it encompasses a whole entire space, which is why it's called an installation and not a singular object. It's the same spiral like what we saw with Nelman with the neon lights, but it's the whole entire ramp system and the whole entire interior atrium of the Guggenheim, which makes it an installation piece. All right. Um, so be able to kind of compare and contrast Holzer's Untitled with um, um, with a, a, a Nomen's piece, N-A-U-M-A-N, -A -A in the last chapter. Okay. So now let's talk about more site-specific, or talk about site-specific. Remember, it needs to be uh, specifically done in a location for a certain reason. We're going to look at figure 3244, and we're going to talk about Christo and Jean-Claude. Um, Christo and Jean-Claude. <clears throat> and Christo and Jean-Claude, they were environmental artists, and that is a, essentially advancement in the earthworks that we talked about prior to. Um, when whenever we looked at Smithson Spiral Jetty, that's in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, well, Salt Lake, Utah, the actual lake itself. Um, and those earthworks are based off of the idea of environmentalism and being aware of the environment and what uh, constructionism as well as industrialization is doing that is affecting uh, the environment. So uh, Jean-Claude and Christo are... Um, uh, progressive artists based off of these origins of like the spiral jetty done by Smithson. Um, <clears throat> and what uh, Christo and Jean-Claude want to do, they want to intensify the viewer's awareness of the space that they're in and what is surrounding them. One thing that they did that's different um, than what uh, Smithson did is they did not alter the earth at all. If anything, they, they made it better in that for example, these little made-up islands, I'll explain it here in just a little bit, they cleaned them up where it had a whole bunch of trash on the beaches, and then they cleaned them up, um, each and every one, which fits to their envir environmentalism and the idea of environmental studies and art. Um, but they didn't move the earth or alter it like what Smithson did with Spiral Jetty. He came in with the big construction machines and moved the earth and built it up to show the impact of those machines and how the impact of those machines are actually impacting the whole world. So it's a little bit different. But what they did is they temporarily modified the landscape with cloth. And in this case, it's a pink polypropylene uh, floating fabric that's around the islands. Okay to almost give it the sense of this beach that's being developed around these islands with this uh, floating pair, um, this floating pink uh, polypropylene. Um, so they would temporarily modify the landscape with cloth. And a couple examples is 
um, there is a coastline very similar to what they're doing with the islands here in Australia where they laid out a hundred oh, they laid out a million square foot of cloth floating cloth on the beach and totally covered it up and then they also in Colorado um, rifle gap they completely created the sheet that covers rifle gap from one side of the chasm to the other side and they're just there temporarily for a few weeks so even though it only lasts for a few weeks like surrounded islands here figure 3244 it takes them years sometimes up to three or four years to do the research and the proper investigation on uh, the material that they want to use and then also they have to work with the um, with local authorities to be allowed to do this um, so it requires a lot of open conversation uh, between um, the local authorities as well as um, doing the research before they do that so here surrounded islands it's in Florida and what's really interesting about these 11 islands that they're covering with this pink poly uh, polypropylene floating fabric is that these islands are not they they're they're not self-made they're made by uh, a dredging or a human construction experiment so with Smithson he actually used the equipment to create um, uh, and redo the earth and to alter the earth but here they're emphasizing the earth that's already been altered by by creating these floating pink poly uh, polypropylene um, pieces of fabric and they raised money to do this, this was a 3.2 million dollar project they raised money by selling prepared drawings uh, collages and models and then they also cleaned up all the 11 islands from the trash to create a better contrast between the pink and the green. So these islands that you see here were full of trash that just gets built up um, that, that was tossed in the ocean or ultimately made their way to the ocean. And they cleaned all that up, which fits with the environmentalistic art. And then they're super clean. There's no trash on them. So that contrasts the pink um, even better. So really stand out environmental art piece called again earthworks so I'll leave it at that we'll talk about a few more artists in one more short video and that will conclude um, chapter 32